Hello. Good morning, DevOps. Welcome on the third day, and welcome to my presentation, which today is Seven Deadlier Sins of Craftsmanship. My name is Tomek, and I want to welcome you. A few words about me. I was a software developer, then I started to be some more process, agile roles involved, like Scrum Master, some agile trainers, to finally become a leader and manager, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm a manager, unfortunately, maybe, for some. Uh, looking after some teams, helping them to achieve everything they want, uh, and making their life hopefully easier, not harder. And today the presentation will be not technical. I have to tell you that uh, very much in front. As I am a manager, I'm not coding, so I won't try to pretend that I know technical stuff very well. So we'll talk a little bit about psychology, about some cognitive biases, things that are in our heads, the way we are programmed, that makes us behave in certain ways, and how this can affect our work on an everyday basis, how it can affect us as software craftsmen. So, Probably the first question, why seven deadlier sins, not simply seven deadly sins? It will be much easier. Seven deadly sins is like from the Bible and so on. So why deadlier sins? I will try to explain it to you, or I will explain it to you simply in like next three or four minutes when we get to the right slide. But first, I don't want this to be like an ordinary, regular, kind of boring presentation. I want to do something different, right? I want to play a game. And those of you who are fans of horror movies probably recognize this quote straight away, right? Like, the soul. And that movie wasn't fun. It wasn't a fun game, right? There was like blood, flash, and guts flying everywhere. So it wasn't really nice. So are we going to do something like this today? The answer is no. We're going to play something much more pleasant, something much more interesting, and hopefully something that you will learn from. And the second question you might ask yourself, especially people who were here at DevOx last year, it's the question like, Again? Because last year at DevOps, I started my presentation exactly with the same slide. So are we having the same presentation again? The answer is no. We're going to play a game, but it'll be a bit different game than last year. Today it's going be, to be kind of an adventure game. We'll be going through some chapters, learning from some characters we meet, met, meet on the way. And um, first of all, every presentation needs a theme, right? And today we are going retro. We are going retro, we are going back to the 80s. I know that calling 80s uh, retro time because we are all from the 80s, so it's not very cool. But for games, 80s is definitely a retro. So we're going retro, there will be plenty of pixel arts, plenty of retro characters, and so on. So I hope you will enjoy that trip together with me. So first, as I said, we go back to the 80s, but we have to have kind of a main theme for the presentation. And those of you who actually seen any time in the past any of my presentations, you know you, I very much inspire myself with TV shows, books, comics, movies, and so on. So today I also wanted to have a presentation in my theme to put the game into some world. So I was watching one of the TV shows, a very good one, which really inspired me for this. And why not deadly sins but deadlier sins? You can probably guess what I was watching last year all the time. Stranger Things. Amazing. If you haven't seen this show, you should definitely do it. The next third season is coming in on 4th July, so it's like next week. Amazing. So today we are going back to the 80s. We're going back to the 80s together with Stranger Things theme. If you haven't seen this show, don't worry. It will, it will not affect uh, you know, the perception of the presentation, and we will have, you will have the same learnings. So, not deadly sins, but deadlier sins. We're going back to the 80s with Stranger Things and Stranger Things theme. So just like in Stranger Teams, when we had a crew of four characters having an adventure, the same today. We will have a team that will be going through different chapters, meeting different characters, and trying to learn from these characters. So, let's meet the team. So just like in Stranger Things, as I said, four people in here, four teenagers. First one is Lucas. Lucas, let's give him some role. L, L stands for, not loser, leader. So Lucas is the leader. Then we have Mike. M stands for, any ideas? Manager, obviously, no one likes them, but there have to be some managers. Next, we have 11. E stands for, that's a tricky one. Ah, that would be sim too simple. End user. And last but not least, we have Dustin. And D stands for? Obviously. 
Dustin is the developer, and he's the most important person today because looking through his eyes, we will try to learn things. From, from developer's perspective, we'll try to look at the characters we are going to meet in the next parts of the presentation, and we will try to learn what we can improve or what are the traps that are in our brains that cause us to act in a certain way, to behave in a certain way. So, if you are ready, let our adventure begin. So, chapter number one, the first deadly sin, pride. In every chapter, we will discuss a given deadly sin, we will meet a person who is a great representative of this sin, and we will try to get some learning and to learn what in our brains causes a certain behavior. So who can we meet in here? Who is a very good example of pride? If you played Pokemon or any other this kind of game in the 90s, you probably recognize this. So who can we meet in here? Who is a very good example of being really proud, really too confident, even cocky? Any ideas? From world of TV shows, movies, and so on. Do you have any ideas? Try to guess. Who? No, but that would be a good idea. <laughs> no, I think there's a person who is definitely much more cocky, and this is Sheldon Cooper. So Sheldon Cooper appears, right? Zinga. And Sheldon Cooper was definitely a guy who was like, thinking that he's like too smart, like Sheldon thinks he knows everything, right? He thought he knows everything, he has all the knowledge, and probably this man is like the best explanation of this, a best proof. My brain is better than everybody's. I know everything, I have the knowledge, and so on. But actually, if you watch the Bing Bang Theory, it wasn't, a, wasn't true, there were plenty of situations where he wasn't actually right. And this was like this, this say what moments, it was surprising that he actually he thought he has all the knowledge, but it wasn't true. He was making a mistake because he was too confident, he was too proud. And here I wanted to share a quote with you. And the quote is, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's illusion of knowledge. Do you know who said that? It was Stephen Hawking, who well, unfortunately quite recently passed away. So quote both Stephen Hawking and if you look at these words, if you think about these words, they are so wise, because it's not ignorance that is the greatest enemy. Because if you are an ignorant, you, you don't have the knowledge and you don't care, that's okay, because you won't make any decisions based on that. You won't take any actions. You won't act on false assumptions. But the problem is the illusion of knowledge. Sometimes we think we know, and we try to make decisions based on this knowledge, try to act based on this knowledge. And we think that our knowledge is certain, that our knowledge is kind of a fact, but that's not true. This is the illusion of knowledge. And this, in psychology, this is a psychological effect that affects all of us. The illusion of knowledge says that we trust our knowledge too much. We think that our knowledge, what we know, is a fact. But actually, it's not true. When we make decisions based only on knowledge, this is based on assumptions, not on facts. So the learning from this chapter here is, that our decisions, our ideas, may be based on opinions, on assumptions, on gut feelings, because knowledge, because experience, is only an illusion. So if you make a decision based on experience, based on knowledge, this is good, right? I'm not saying that's bad, that can help you make a good decision. But there's another thing, it can also lead you to making a bad decision in terms of design, in terms of architecture, in terms of whatever you do, it can also lead you to making a wrong decision basing on false assumption. So that was chapter number one. Let's go to chapter number two. Chapter number two is greed. Here we, me here we meet some greedy, nasty character. A really stereotype, bad stereotype of a manager, to be honest. So who can we meet in here? Any ideas? Who can we meet in here? A really greedy guy. I haven't heard that. No. Here we met, meet Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns from one of my favorite cartoons, The Simpsons. So Mr. Burns appears. Excellent. So this guy was greedy, right? This is all he was interested in. He wanted money, he wanted this gold. It's all mine, right? This is what he wanted. But I don't want to talk about money in here. First, because I'm not quite confident in this topic, and second thing, I don't have eight hours of your time. So I don't want to talk about money. 
I want to talk about something a bit different. I want to talk about these treasures, this, our treasures we have in our IT world, in our projects, in our everyday job, things we like to do. Because we have these cool things, these nice, I don't know, greenfield projects where we can experiment or trying some new fancy shining technology or, I don't know, maybe doing a demo for a customer to, you know, like boost our visibility. Those are the cool things we want to have and we want to have them all for ourselves. But there's a problem with that and another psychological effect comes into play. So we want all this, but there is something that we can lose doing this. Because I hope that, oh, that's like, this is how we feel, more or less, when we have all this task, right? We feel like a child in the candy factory or candy shop. So what comes into play in here? I hope that this picture may help you a little bit. I wanted to tell you about something that is called the cheerleader effect. The cheerleader effect, and probably some of you recognize this already and will say like, Man, what are you talking about? This is absolutely not it. The uh, cheerleader effect is some crazy theory from TV shows. But actually there is in psychology a, a cheerleader effect, and it's proven to be true in some uh, environments, in some societies. But in general, cheerleader effect says that in a group we seem more attractive than on our own. But I don't want to talk in here about attractiveness. I don't want to talk about who's pretty, who's not, because Come on, it's an IT conference. So I wanted to change a little bit this cheerleader effect to something like my own, from my own observations. And this is actually no, not based on, not backed up by any actual psychological research. It's just mine, my thoughts. So I wanted to change this that in a group we seem more attractive to in a group we are simply seen more awesome. And why I'm saying this? Because, guys, we are not living in the Wild West anymore. We are not alone cowboys doing all the work on our own. If you are trying to do everything by yourself, you will fail most probably. You won't achieve all you want simply because you need more hands. You need people who will support you. You will need people who have buying for your ideas, for your solutions, to make this happen, make it, make it come into life. So it, when you are alone, when you are working on your own, simply you want, may not achieve everything because you need other people to help you. And even if you, are have, you have a great idea, you come to the manager or anyone who's making the final call and you say it on your own, it doesn't seem that good. But if you are able to gather around people, if you are able to buy, have a buy-in from your team, to have buy-in from other people you work with, this is awesome. You show that there's the, you can bring people together and make something happen. So this is the cheerleader effect by me. And I think that this is very important. And the learning from here is that actually you may not achieve all you want on your own. And especially if you are taking all the cool stuff for yourself and no one will like you and you will end up forever alone, which is kind of sad. So chapter number two is done. Let's go to chapter number three. Chapter number three is lust. Here we meet very, very lustful character. character. Do you have any idea who can this be? Who can we meet in here? A very lustful guy who was like really willing to pick up all the women. Ho who? Barney Stinson. Exactly. So here we meet Barney Stinson. Barney Stinson appears. Barney Stinson, who is awesome. If you don't recognize him from here, you probably recognize this guy straight away. Kind of a like a really character, a true persona in like world of, in general, like media. He became a man and everything. So Barney Stinson was awesome and Barney Stinson wanted everything, right? He wanted everything, all for himself. He wanted all the beautiful women. He wanted all the best suits. He wanted money. He wanted fame. He wanted everything. He was lustful. He was really, really lustful. But if you think about it, well, the question is why he wanted all this. Because if any of you have seen How I Met Your Mother show, the, obviously the thing he was looking for was a true love. <laughs> obviously, right? TV show. So the question is, why he wanted all this? And the answer to this question is very simple. Because he saw other people in best suits, picking up women, having money, being famous, and he wanted the same things. He hoped that the same things will give him happiness because he saw other people acting like this, being happy. So he thought if he does the same, then he will be happy as well. He was mimicking some things, hoping to achieve the same result. And this is a perfect example of a psychological phenomena for me, 
called the cargo cult. I don't know how many of you heard about the cargo cult, but when I, for the first time, heard about it, I was like amazed with the story. It was like shocking. To give you a quick explanation of what the cargo cult is, we have to go back to the Second World War, when Americans were fighting Japanese on the Pacific Ocean. So J Americans were building their bases on this Pacific Ocean, the wild Pacific Ocean islands, where there were wild people, wild like local people, who never seen any civilization or anything like this. So they went there, they started to build their bases, right? They started to build like runways for planes to take off and land. They started to build radars. They started to build like flight control towers and all stuff like this. And obviously they had to build some relation with this local wild man. So they started to give them some gifts and so on. And obviously if you are a wild man who never seen any civilization, there's a, there are people coming from the sky and giving you gifts. They are gods, right? It's like a pure definition of God coming from the sky, giving you things. So they thought Americans were gods. But then the war was over, and Americans flew back home. So looking again from this wild man perspective, it was like, the gods were here, and now they're gone. We have to do something to bring them back. So they started to do exactly the same things that Americans were doing, hoping to bring, bring them back. So they started to build planes, they started to build runways, they started to build radars, flight control towers, from whatever they could found, find. So they started to build all this stuff from sticks, from clay, from bamboo, from ropes, and stuff like this. And they were hoping that Americans will come back. And now, when we look from our perspective at this, us as civil civilized people who actually know how planes work, this seems so silly, right? You silly wild people, this is not how the plane works. This is like a silly story. But look, we are doing the same things in our organization. We are doing the same things in our projects because we see something that other company is doing and we apply the same practices. We take the same practices and try to apply them in our work, hoping to achieve the same effects. And I'm not saying that's bad because it's really good to look at big players, to to look at the companies that are setting trends like Google, Spotify, Netflix, and so on. It's good to look at these guys and look at what are they doing, but they do these things for the reason. And this is the thing we have to remember. They are doing those things for a reason. They are achieving some effects because they are prepared to do this, this technique, this method, this framework, whatever you have there. there, is there it's there for a reason, and they, it's designed, it's, it's applied to achieve a certain effect. And if we just take all these things and put into our projects, it simply may not work. This will be a cargo cult. And you want to end up with a jumbo jet with applying this, all the practices you learned from Google or something else. And instead of ending up with a jumbo jet, you end up with a plane from sticks. And it doesn't work. So the learning in here is that you may introduce new things, tools, frameworks, processes, whatever, only because others do, without understanding why you actually need them. So chapter number three is done. We go to the chapter number four. Chapter number four is envy. Envy. So we meet in here a little mean guy who's really envy, who's really jealous of everyone else. So who will be a really good example of this sin? Ideas? Stewie. Nope. But um, it's not a bad idea. However, I have a better example. Here, we meet Eric Cartman. We meet Eric Cartman from South Park, like, screw you guys. I'm going home. So we meet this guy. This guy was really a mean little, let's say, bastard to be more or less kind of like keep some level. <laughs> so he was a mean guy. He was really envy, really jealous. So he, in general, Hated. He hates when other, other people are kind of, I don't know, happier, if they are better than him, or actually whatever, right? He always thought that his ideas, he must be on the top, he must be the number one. And the thing is that, you know, we have these people around. We have these people in the meetings. There is sometimes Eric Cartman inside us, and you can easily see when you have a discussion on some solution, on applying some, I don't know, ar new architecture, something like this, you can see these people. If there's not their idea being, you know, like chosen, if it's not their idea being implemented, you can see them. It's like there are some signs you can understand that here's Eric Cartman coming up, right? This angry eyebrows, like this, you know, like this 
clenched lips, rapidly blinking eyes. This is all signs that this guy is like, Ugh, I know better. I want my idea to be chosen. I want my solution to be chosen. And the thing is that Eric Cartman is even worse because he's not only willing to have his idea on the top, but also he kind of enjoys when other people fail. It's not only that his idea must be the best one, but when other people fail, he, like, he has this satisfaction, right? Like, again, the proof, mm, your tears are so yummy and sweet. I enjoy when you fail. And I have to say, like, we are professionals, right? We are adults, we are professional, we don't behave that way. But I started to think about it, and is that really true? We don't behave that way. Maybe we don't say it like this, but if I had to translate this, mm, your tears are so yummy and sweet, into our IT language, I would say it's something like, I told you so. <laughs> right? Like, we're professionals, so you know, like poker face here, but inside you're laughing, like, oh, I, I had a better idea, and you chose this one, and it didn't work. Like, I told you so. I'm sorry it happened that way, but I told you so. That's us. That's our little Eric Cartman inside, right? And the thing is that this Eric Cartman usually shows up when this discussion starts. Where the discussion starts, we have some different ideas, then ah, I want mine to be on the top. I want this idea, this is my idea to be chosen. And when the discussion starts, again, we are professional, we are adults, but when the discussion starts, it's actually usually something like, I'm right and you're wrong. And if you want to discuss, well, we can discuss how wrong you are. Simply, yeah? Because it's not like I'm looking for people to give me feedback on my solution. Yes, they can do it, but it's wrong. <laughs> Mine is good. So that's the problem. And here, another cognitive bias comes into play, and this is called the confirmation bias. This is another psychological effect that is in our heads and affects our way of working. So co confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is something like, if you to explain it, it's that we as people, we are looking for opinions, we are looking for arguments that agree with what we think, and we give a greater value to these ideas. And we give a lower value to the things we don't agree with. So in short words, it means that we are looking for stuff that we agree with. And to give you an example of this, let's say, let's, let's have a little conflict, let's have some like, little technical conflict. I say that we should go to production without any testing. And I don't know. Um, you, please, do you agree with that? That's cool. Can you tell everybody where you work? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a conflict. This is not interesting. I need to choose another person. You, please. Um, do you agree with that? Should we go to production without any testing? Yes. Perfect. We have a conflict here. Oh, we have a conflict. This is interesting. I'll go down because I didn't see you very well. Okay, so we have conflict here. So what do we do when we have conflict in our work? What do we do when we have a conflict in our projects? We need to find a solution. We ask for a second opinion, obviously. So you say, we are, should be testing before production. I'm saying, no, let's go to production straight away. So let me ask you another person. You, for example, please. Do you think we should be testing before production? <laughs> but yes or no? We should test. We should test. OK. That's enough for me. I think you're a junior. <laughs> this opinion is wrong. I don't know, this is wrong. Another person, your opinion is not valid. Oh, hey, man, I know this guy, so should we, Victor, should we test before production? Absolutely, yes. Again, Junior, Victor, come on. Anyone else? You, should we, should we be testing before production? Say no. No. No, that's the senior. You are some architect, <laughs> right? So I'm like, let's listen to this guy. And this is the confirmation bias in practice. I was looking for people, of course, all these are over you know, like exaggerated, but I was looking for someone who agrees with me. And now I give greater value to this guy, greater value to this opinion. This is how our brain works. So this is confirmation bias. So what's the learning from here? The learning from here is that you may ignore the best idea only because it's not yours. You can ignore the best design, the best architecture, the best solution, only because it's not yours. And you'll be fighting for your solution because this is how our brains tells us to do. Chapter number four done. Let's go to chapter number five. Chapter number five is gluttony. Gluttony, who can we meet in here? Someone who really eats a lot. A really big guy. Any ideas? 
from, again, one of my favorite cartoons. Here we meet Peter Griffin from Family Guy. Peter Griffin, who's obviously saying that he's not fat. However, in one of the episodes, it was proven that he has his own gravitational field, right? But he's not fat, right? Gluttony. Gluttony is about eating. Eating, eating, and eating. Eating as much as we can, right? So how can we translate this into our IT world? Well, obviously, we can use more and more things. We can use more and more tools, right? We can use tools as many as we can, because they are cool, because they are fancy, they look good in the CV, so let's put all them in the project. But that's not really good, because it actually increases complexity. But there's something worse that is happening. When we have enough tools, we don't have any more to add. What do we like to do? Let's go back to our main character, let's go back to Dustin. So Dustin has an idea. So, better idea. Let's craft our own tools. Because we are doing such an innovative project that no one did before. We don't have the right tools, so we'll craft our own tools, right? And this is like, you can see people in your organizations who are actually working on their own project, especially like own tool, own framework, especially at the beginning, right? Because they are, have this fire. They are motivated, they have fire, they are doing some greenfield work, they are doing some cool, super cool stuff, and you know, like, this is something brand new that will change the work, so, world, so they feel at least like Elon Musk. So, you know, like you put, combine this fire and this Elon Musk attitude, you get, like, really motivated guys who look like unicorns with, you know, like, wind in their hair going through the corridors. But then the reality comes. And actually, building your own tools, building your own frameworks is not that simple, so it kind of demotivates you, and after some time, you are not that happy with what you are doing. The second thing is that if you have plenty of your own tools in your project, you have like so big complexity that if anyone joins your team, they spend like half a year learning what you are using, because there are some like own frameworks. And in general, after being this happy, you know, like unicorn at the very beginning, you end up kind of like a sub pony. So why are we doing this? Even though on every conferences, Oh, every conference I've been to, everyone is saying, like, don't do your own frameworks. Use open source, use the existing tools. And what we do in all our companies? We build our own frameworks, right? Because there's no proper solution to, I don't know, monitor the cloud. There is no proper solution to write tests in the, in the cloud. There is no framework that, I don't know, for performance tests or anything like this. We have to do it on our own. And we build these frameworks. We build that. And the worst thing is that we keep stuck with them. We keep stuck with them, and why is this happening? And I wanted to explain you again some psychological cognitive bias that stands behind that. And to help you understand, I wanted to show you this picture. Some of you probably know that, especially people from Krakow. This is the IKEA here on Bronowice. So I wanted to tell you now about something that is called the IKEA effect. And the IKEA effect is very simple. Well, if you look at this shop, if you look at the IKEA, well, if you look at their products, well, they are, no, no, they are not top quality, right? They are not like the best quality. They are not the cheapest even. And the more, more you have to take them home and put it together on your own. So, kind of sucks. So why they are so popular? Well, the key thing here is that you have to put this furniture together on your own. And this is the IKEA effect from this brand. Uh, IKEA effect says that we put a greater value in our own creations. So if you buy a chair in Ikea, you bring it home, you put it together, well, it's somehow crooked, right? It's not comfortable perfectly, it's not that comfortable, you know? But it's yours, right? You feel like a hero in your home. You are the man, the manly man, right? Thousands of years ago, this was like hunting a lion with your bare hands. Now it's like putting a chair from Ikea. But you feel the man, and this is it. You created it, so you give it a greater value. So the learning from here is that more is not better, especially in terms of tools and processes and so on. And the second thing is that your tool may not be the best one. You may think so only because you created it yourself. Chapter number five is done. Let's go to chapter number six. Chapter number six is wrath, anger. Someone with really anger, true anger management issues. Who can we meet in here? I can give you a hint. This this guy is really green. <laughs> Hulk, definitely. So in this chapter, we meet Hulk. Hulk, the green guy, Hulk smash, right? This guy truly had some anger management issues. So what can we learn from this guy? Like, 
Getting angry, destroying everything is like not the best feature. Let's be honest. So wh what can we met me what can we learn? What can we learn from from that guy? Well, honestly, I had a problem with translating graph to our behaviors in, in the world, IT world, in our projects. So first I started to read about anger itself, and it turns out that anger is a like, natural emotion that is protecting us. Well, question, protecting us from what? Protecting us from the things we consider wrong. So if something is wrong, something is not as we would like it to be, then we get angry. And I started to think about myself. Um, I'm, it's not like I'm, I'm kind of an emotional guy, right? So if you ask any people who work with me, I would say, like, yeah, I'm getting angry, happy, and sad all in around one minute. So I'm kind of getting angry very often, but it's not like I'm coming to the office, I'm angry at 9 a.m., I keep being angry till 5 p.m., and I go home. No, it's usually I'm getting angry because something happened. There's, there was some decision taken, there was some action. Something happened, and this caused anger. And you know, this is another, there's another cognitive bias, another psychological effect that comes into play in here, and it's called deflection to the result. So deflection to the result, what is deflection to the result? Deflection to the result says that we as people, we look at the final result only. We focus on the final result, and our brains tend to ignore all the context. To give you an example of this, let, let, let's have an example. Um, to make it like easier to remember and, and easier to, 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 to understand. Let's have an example. You see a guy on the street with a brand new iPhone. Brand new, this one of the most expensive ones, this new one. So you see the guy with a brand new iPhone. And let's, for this example, assume that iPhone is actually a good phone. Okay? That's important. So let's assume that iPhone is a good phone and you see a guy with an iPhone on the street. So what do you think? You'll say that, yeah, he, he made a good decision. Yeah, this was good. Well, it's, yeah, it's a bit expensive, but this is a great phone, great value. So this was a good decision. But you have no idea what he did to actually buy this iPhone, because maybe he took a loan. Or maybe he sold his kidney to buy this phone. If you knew that, you probably would say, like, man, this is the most stupid idea ever. But our brain works like this. Our brain looks at the final result, looks at the effect, and judges, ignoring all the context. Our brain just works like this by default. So to give you, like, again, some brief explanation, when we have something, there is some result. If we agree with that, then, yeah, we are super happy. If we don't agree with that, well, psh, that's all sucks. Here's my resignation. I quit. But the thing is that to this result, to this particular decision, to this particular action, that was the entire path that led to it. And the thing is that we cannot ignore this path because this is where learning happens. You cannot learn anything from the result only. And our brains tend to look at the result only. So that kind of distracts us from learning. Here the learning is. So we have to be very careful when judging things because our brains tend to ignore all the rest and focusing on the result. So the learning here, is, learning here is that your judgment may be based not on full information because you ignore the context. Chapter number six done. Let's go to chapter number seven. This is sloth. Sloth, laziness. Who can we meet in here? Who is a very good example of being lazy? Any ideas? Who? <laughs> Send me your picture, I'll put them in the slides. <laughs> okay, so here we meet again from my favorite Simpsons, the Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson appears, he's kind of sleeping at the moment, so let's not distract him, let's go to this. This is another quote, I won't ask you who, who told that because it's obviously one of the smart thoughts from Homer Simpson. So trying is the first step towards failure. And you know what's funny? Then when you actually read that, it's kind of true, right? It's like, it's hard to disagree. If you don't try anything, well, you won't fail. But the problem is that if you won't try anything, you will also not succeed. And that's the problem because, you know, IT world is changing so fast, the technologies are changing so fast that we have to try new things. We have to keep experimenting. We have to do new things. Otherwise, we will just be lost. We have to keep up to date. And here again, our brain kind of prevents us from doing that. So let's see this. Let's, on our adventure, let's say that Dustin is, 
in front of the junction. And he has a one way to choose out of two. So one is the old way that he knows very well. He traveled it plenty of times. And the second road is brand new. So he never walked through this way. What will he do? Well, most probably he'll say something like, OK, I choose the old way. I know it well. So I'll go this way because it's like, yeah, I know it. And that's the problem. And this thing in psychology is called a well-traveled road effect. In general, it says that, well, our brain tends to play it safe and choose the solution we know, the things we already know, we do, did them, and so on. Because, you know, during like thousands of years of evolution, our brain had just one task, right? It was to keep us alive. So thanks to evolution, in develop a strategy that is quite successful because we are still here, right? And the strategy was play it safe. Other strategies that weren't like this didn't succeed that well, right? If we, I don't know, like, I don't know. If someone thought that it would be very good to fight, I don't know, a lion with the bare hands, it didn't work, right? We are here, we don't see many people fighting with lions, for example. Or at least if we, when we see them, we see them for a very short, short time, and they're done. So our brain had this strategy to play it safe. And this is what is happening. This is how our ro brain works by default. So if there's something new to be chosen, our brain will say, nah. Let's choose the old way, it's safer. Let's, let's don't do it, because it might kill you. <laughs> so this is the thing. But the problem is that you can travel the same road 100 times, and this will be OK. But there will be this 101st time when this road turns out to be a dead end, and you can actually crash. So the learning from here, from the seventh chapter, is that using the same way all the time may simply give you no results. Chapter seven, done. Chapter number eight, the grand finale. Because we went through all the deadly sins. We went through all this. And guys, we have to confess. We have to confess, right? Don't worry. We can confess in here. Everything we say in here stays between us, stays in here, and obviously on YouTube, but let's not worry about that. So we can confess, right? We sinned. Come on, guys. Didn't you have this, I don't know, this Sheldon Cooper moment when you had this, like, you were discussing some solution and you had this feeling inside like, I know how we should do it. Let's stop discussing it, just let's do it like I say. Or you had this Homer Simpson moment where you were saying like, why are we discussing this? Let's just do it like we always did and let's go home. It's obvious. We had this, this is in our brains, this is, this is part of who we are as people, as human beings. So we have to confess, we sinned. I sinned, you sinned, Dustin sinned, obviously. And what happens to you when you sin? Well, you go to hell. So Dustin goes to hell. And who's in hell? There's Mr. Devil. So Mr. Devil appears, and Mr. Devil says, ha ha, welcome to hell, you sinner. It's time for your punishment, right? The best thing, now it's time to punish. But the thing is that all the behaviors, all these bad behaviors we are discussing are actually subconscious. It's not like we want to behave this way. This is how our brain is programmed. So now when we are aware that this is happening for us subconsciously, now we can change this bad behavior and turn them into something good, right? So not for so fast, Mr. Devil, because we can change what we do. So how can we change this? Well, we had these bad behaviors, right? First, in the first chapter, we met Sheldon Cooper, who was so proud. He was trusting his knowledge too much, and he was making bad decisions based on assumptions, based on his like, gut feelings and on his illusions. So it was bad, because it was leading from time to time to really bad decisions. So how can we change that into a good behavior? Well, simply, instead of basing on our opinions, basing on our assumptions and so on, we can simply start using data and start to try, at least, to do some data-driven decisions. Start to make data-driven decisions. Use data to choose things. Next, in the chapter two, we met greedy Mr. Burns, who was taking everything for himself. He was taking all for himself, and he couldn't achieve all he wanted because no one was working with him. And he was forever alone. And that was bad. So how can we change that? Well, maybe it's time to start working as a team with, together with, you know, other, I don't know, BAs, QAs, whoever there is, but starting to work together, starting to work together as a team, because then you can achieve much more. Then in chapter three, we met lustful Barney Stinson. Barney Stinson who wanted everything. He was putting all and all, he wanted all the things, and he was affected by the cargo cult. He was mimicking what he saw in other companies and putting the same practices into his project, but it wasn't bringing any results. So how can we get, do this differently? 
Well, we can start with one very important question. We can start with why. By the way, this is an amazing book by Simon Sinek, so I definitely recommend you to read it. So we can start with why. Why we want to apply these practices, why we want to use this tool, what we want to achieve. Then, chapter four, we met this little mean Eric Cartman. Eric Cartman, who, was, who wanted his ideas to be on top, to his solutions to be implemented. So he was affected by the confirmation bias, and on every discussion he was looking for arguments that were supporting his vision, and he was pushing his ideas on top. And this wasn't the best ideas. So what, what we can do to assess the ideas? Well, if we have data, we, we know what we want to achieve. Maybe it's time to apply some metrics. Try to start to measure things. By the way, again, measure everything. Again, another great book. Definitely recommendation uh, to read for you all. Next, in chapter five, we met gluttony, Peter Griffin, who was eating and eating and eating and putting all the tools, all the, and all the frameworks to his project. And we, when it was not enough, he was crafting his own tools and kept stuck with them because of IKEA effect, because he was thinking they are so great when they actually weren't. So now again, how can we turn this behavior to something good? Well, if we have data, metrics, we can start to evaluate the real value. We can start to think, what are these tools bringing? What is the value? If there's no value, time to kick it out. I know it can be hard if you, you know, like polished your tool for the last two years, but sometimes it's time to say goodbye. Next, we met the angry Hulk who was smashing everything because he was looking at the results only. But this was caused by deflection to the results. He was looking at the result only, ignoring all the context. So how can we avoid that? Well, instead of looking at our project only, our next task, our next sprint, maybe it's time to start seeing the big picture. What's happening in the organization? What is actually needed? So looking broader to get more knowledge, to get better understanding of what is happening. Then finally, in the last chapter, chapter seven, we met lazy sleeping Homer Simpson, who was so lazy that he was choosing the same solutions all the time because of the well-traveled road effect, who was like, which was like blocking him for trying the new ways. And it was bad because he was doing all the same things and achieving no result. So how can you change this? Well, if you have all these six good behaviors I told you about just a minute er ago, you can start to run small, well-defined experiments. If you have data, you have metrics, you know why you are doing things, you know what you want to achieve, you have buy-in from your team, you see the big picture, how it fits the bigger picture, then you can define and execute small, good experiments and achieve value much faster. And now with these good behaviors, these good behaviors I've been talking about here, they are a great foundation. They are a great foundation that you can build on. You can build on these behaviors. Let me tell you once again these good behaviors. Data-driven decisions, working as a team, starting with why, measuring things, evaluating real value, seeing that big picture, and running experiments. On these good behaviors, you can start to build something amazing, which I like to call this craftsmanship culture. You can start to build this craftsmanship culture in your team where everyone feels that, where everyone understands what we want to do, and this craftsmanship, this true craftsmanship, is in the way you work. And if you have this in your team, you can go up and from the, like, the bottom try to change more. You can start to building this software craftsmanship culture in your entire organization. And if you achieve this, if craftsmanship is in your culture, in, is in the way of working in your company, in your organization, this is an awesome place to be. This is an awesome place to be because you can try new things. No one will ask you why you want to achieve it and how much it will take. Because experiments are there. You can try new technologies, you can try new frameworks, you can grow as craftsman, you can grow as developer. So being in such company, being in company or being in an organization that craftsmanship is a part of a culture is great. And this is something that I definitely wish all of you. And that's it from me. Thank you very much.